Hello, everybody. Hey. We'll wait a little longer. People are jumping in. Cool. We'll be starting soon, I guess in one minute. Interesting to see all the comments here, actually. <laughs> Oh, Devon say you need to start now. Yep. We'll wait a little longer. Yeah. Oh my, 42 of you guys. Are we starting soon? I guess in one minute. Okay. Uh, we shall start. My name is Ayas, and uh, with me is George. We are the hosts for you tonight. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us, uh, all 43 of you right now. Um, yeah, I know some of you are just rushed from Breaking Fast. I know I did. And, uh, yeah, we are looking forward to giving you a nice session tonight. Uh, but we have a Slido poll going on right now. Uh, if uh, it was a wrong link previously in the description, you can refresh and come in. And uh, we'll show you the results shortly. One second. All right. Oh. Okay. So the question is, where are you in your AI data journey? Lots of level one. I know I'm a level one too. Very, very interesting to see. But we have people in level four as well. <laughs> We'll leave this in for a while. A few more people coming in. Right, we'll leave this poll open and we'll come back to it later. So we want to be mindful of your time. So we'll swiftly move along and try to finish up within the hour. So yes, we are doing data council talks, virtual edition. And uh, George, maybe you can go through some housekeeping first. Sure. All right, housekeeping rules. Uh, feel free to ask away right in the comment section in the YouTube live. Uh, we will highlight them and uh, highlight them during the Q&A section so the speakers can see your questions. And also help us answer the poll and uh, we will get a lot of feedbacks and also answers and stuff that we can know from the poll. And also this live stream will be uh, posted on the YouTube channel and next week, but the meetup uh, slides would still be there so you can see. And uh, some of the important links are also in the description, including the Slido and uh, the feedback form. Do check it out. And yeah, that's all. All right. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors for today. Sponsors are Engineers My. Uh, these, these two uh, logos are actually uh, one of it is Dev Kami, the other one is Engineers My. If you don't know about Engineers My, they're like, they they try to be the open source hub for Malaysian engineers, designers, product. And uh, yeah, you can check them out, engineers.my. And actually, we're streaming in the Engineers My YouTube channel. So all of our previous recordings are also in this channel. Yeah, thank you. So they sponsored basically the tool we're using to stream, which is StreamYard. Cool. Okay, we'll go through... This is what we'll be going through today. We'll first cover uh, Data Council, what it is, uh, what is Data Council KL. And then we have a segment for you called the Data Dump. And after that, we'll move on to the main event, which are the talks. And uh, finally, we'll have question and answer for the speakers. So yeah, questions can be posted in the YouTube comments. All right, Data Council. Uh, let me briefly tell you what Data, Data Council is. Uh, Data Council are a conference organizer, or uh, they're a company who organizes data conferences. And they organize data conferences worldwide. And I know data conference topic is now a little bit unpopular. Uh, a lot of their conferences are postponed. But let me tell you a little bit of uh, how this uh, community started along with this uh, organization. Uh, data Council is known to have a mantra, and that is the no bullshit data conference. Uh, that just simply means that uh, a lot of times we go to a lot of conferences and uh, we are stuck with a lot of marketing. 
and people selling their tools. But Data Council has uh, has chosen to have more technical, deeply technical talks, having the data scientists in their talks. So you can see uh, engineers from Slack, from uh, different different companies sharing. And uh, yeah, so if you want to know and understand, feel there's no bullshit uh, data conference kind of feel. It's actually you can check out their their YouTube channel and all of their uh, all of their conference recordings are basically there, and you can see all the talks. So that's Data Council, and uh, what is Data Council KL? Data Council KL is basically uh, they wanted so Data Council wanted the feel of going to a conference uh, instead of having it annually. They wanted to have it every sort of every shorter shorter period. So instead of annually, it'll be every other month. They wanted to have this feel, so they decentralize sort of the communities and they support communities in different cities. So we were kind of, we this is where our past meetups. Uh, yep, we've been happy to have a lot of support from uh, companies like Money Lion, Fave, Digi, and uh, these are some of the meetups that we happened last year. So those are the local communities, and these are the ones on the right of the slides are like San Francisco, New York, Barcelona, Singapore. Those are the main conferences that happen every year. Uh, yes, so this is Data Council and Data Council KL. Uh, we previously uh, put, the last meetup we had was on in December. And in December, uh, once we finished, we, we took a two month break, sort of for Chinese New Year. And we wanted to start around March, but then as the COVID situations uh, came about and inc started increasing, we decided to, postpone and eventually now we have the virtual edition. So let me talk to you a little bit about the virtual edition. Uh, these are one hour meetups, one topic per meetup, and we'll try to have it more frequent rather than monthly, maybe every three weeks or so. And later on, we will, we're trying to have a segment where uh, like office hours, basically you will have an uh, sort of like a Zoom or Hangouts chat a small group of people with the speakers after the meetup. So this is currently work in progress, but this is basically the virtual edition and what you're witnessing now is the first one. Yes, so with that, we have another poll that's going active. We'd like to get your feedback. If you all could jump in and let us know what you think about, there'll be two questions coming up. The first one is which platforms do you prefer to join meetups on? Oh, oh. We'll give you guys a minute. All right. I guess I want to predict that YouTube Live would be the winner. <laughs> YouTube Live. <laughs> Look at that. Skype has uh, Skype has some votes. Yeah. Hopefully not trolls. How? <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I recently tried out Zoom webinars. They're actually pretty good too. So Zoom call and webinar is two different things. Is that yeah, one of it is like a conference call. The other one where you have all the faces. Then Zoom webinar is uh, something like this. Right. Okay. Okay, we'll leave that poll live. Uh, let's go to the next poll. And the next poll is, when would you prefer to join meetup, virtual meetups like these? So again, there are a bunch of options. I'll give you guys some time. I personally prefer after work hours. After, yeah, me too. But early morning, uh, maybe you could be the first one. <laughs> Since everyone had to wake up too, so. Uh, yeah. Hope. Right, evening, cool. One child. Yeah. I mean, it's all about experimenting, so I guess. Uh, 
we can experiment during lunch hours too and see how's the response like. <laughs> So yeah, actually most of you could also use the, if you guys are watching through your laptops, you could use your, the Slido app. It's pretty convenient. Yeah. Monday to Friday night is winning. <laughs> Give you guys a few more seconds. All right. So now we're going to our segment called the data dump. By the way, these results, uh, we'll be curating them and publishing them in the slides later. So yes, we will take note and we will experiment on different things for the upcoming meetups. So the next segment, we have the data dump. George, I think you can take over. Yeah, the data dump. I think for the past four months, we've been gathering a lot of uh, data dumps coming from different sources. Uh, so what? We do we do in data dump is that we will talk about the latest uh, tool data leaks and product news that we have curated throughout the entire four months uh, to showcase you showcase you some of the uh, highlights. So I guess the first the first one. Right, right. So for MCO, especially for you, we have our friend from GCP. They have provided us with the uh, a new opportunity to get into a surf learning course for everything GCP under the GCP platform, uh, the latest tools and technologies. Uh, you will be able to complete quests and uh, get some freebies and swags from the GCP teams. So this is for you during the MCO. Uh, yeah, one. for it, we're a bit late. It finishes around, uh, it's one month free for Quick Labs and we're, uh, it finishes in 10th May, I think. Yep. I've only finished like four quests, but that gets me a t-shirt, I think. Yeah, it's cool already. It's cool enough already. So the next one, Falcon. So people who have been using Plotly would most probably know Falcon. Falcon is a uh, inline SQL uh, data visualization tool that you can use. It works with uh, uh, most of the database out there. Like uh, uh, one of it would be, I've forgotten already, but uh, it works. Postgres, Redshift, Most of things, uh, quite the yeah. popular ones are there. Yeah, Redshift would be one of them. Uh, yeah, so Falcon is the second one. So the third one. Yes, Minimal Viable Data Scientist. So it is a documentation on how to be a minimal viable data scientist for fresh graduate like you and I, where we can learn how to write proper codes and uh, package product package code to production, which is very, very important uh, in my honest opinion. Uh, do check it out. Uh, next one. Yes, also for another one for MCO, MCO special is our TensorFlow 2.0 course on uh, free code camp. So technically it is a seven hour course if you do it one hour per day. So it would be about, it would be an entire week that you'll be spending on TensorFlow, which is great. And it's free too. So do check it out. Next one. Right, Transformer family. So this is not the Transformer that we've been talking about. Uh, it's not this two, but it's this, the third one, where Lina Wang put to us a proper way how she describes what a vanilla Transformer is uh, used in NLP. Uh, you can check it out and learn more about it for yourself. Uh, hopefully, it brings a lot more insights and uh, interesting uh, knowledge about Transformers for you. Yeah, do check it out. So GitLab, uh, if everyone, anyone's familiar with GitLab, we've shared about uh, GitLab before, about their data team handbook specifically. And uh, their data team handbook is basically the entire processes and uh, tooling that da the data team of GitLab uses. So why is this relevant? Again, we're bringing it up mainly because since MCO, everyone has become remote. And uh, because of that, uh, and also GitLab is a completely remote company and they have been for a while now. Uh, I mean, since they started. So mm -hmm. GitLab uh, has this documentation. You guys need to check it out. Uh, they talk about their data infrastructure. They talk about 
um, how they run their sprints, all the way to the tooling and when exactly all their pipelines are scheduled. Yeah, it, you can even click on links that lead directly to their Slack Slack channels. So this is pretty cool. And they have the similar thing for their engineering handbooks. And one more thing is this, uh, the data science best practices at Revlin. So uh, it's a good complement to the data science, the, the, the data handbook by GitLab. Basically, uh, they teach you how to treat your data science teams like software engineering teams. This is a good link to check out as well. So for this, we have one of our fellow, we have Ash. Ash is joining us to share. Let me ask Hello. Him. Hi. Hi everyone. So I am Ash, and uh, I'm uh, thanks to IS and George that I can like add an extra two uh, things to the data dump uh, since I've been posting so many links in the WhatsApp channel as well. So um, two things that I want to share that I want to highlight for everyone as well. So the first one is um, <clears throat> this open source project that uh, was released I think about a week or two ago. Uh, and the creator, it's called Grid Studio, and he, the creator basically was talking about how it's really frustrating for him every time to have to like you know export a CSV and then load it into a Python script and then you know uh, you know output to CSV and then load it into Excel and then have Excel crash. So he basically built a web tool that has a spreadsheet and uh, a Python uh, script in one window. So. It runs in a Docker container. You can spin it up super easily. The link is in the title there. Uh, and basically, you should check it out. It, I, I find it to be a very interesting mo uh, way of analyzing uh, that I think is a, uh, it, it's a good complement for Jupyter, <clears throat> where you know Jupyter, you might use it for your more advanced uh, ML stuff later on, while Grid Studio is more useful for like just analyzing tabular data. And then uh, to wrap it up, finally, uh, something coronavirus related because you know we have to have one. Uh, so this is a, a wired opinion piece about how artificial intelligence won't save us from coronavirus. And the uh, I thought it was very interesting. I thought it was important to include this because um, we've seen a lot of companies talk about their particular solutions. For example, for how to predict coronavirus outbreaks, how to identify people who are uh, who are exposed, exhibiting symptoms and whether they're likely to have coronavirus or not. So this opinion piece was written by uh, Alex Engler, and he's a David M. Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institute. And he also released a report on uh, taking a skeptical view on how a AI, the role that AI has to play uh, in tackling the, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. So his main point is always look at the subject matter experts, right? So AI is at a point right now where it's really useful for very uh, small and precise predictions rather than large generalizations. And in that kind of situation, the context of the data is really important. So if you're just throwing, say, a massive COVID-19 data set at, uh, at a model and trying to just tell it, OK, figure out the correlations, it might tell you, for example, that like, oh, it seems that poor people uh, are more likely to get COVID-19. Now, the reason why this is the case is because they tend to live in places that are much more, uh, they, they tend to live in housing that's much more close together and it's more likely for transmission to spread, right? But that doesn't really help us in terms of how to tackle uh, COVID-19. So um, you can check out the link to the opinion article and also in the opinion article, there's a link to the Brookings Institution Report, which is really good reading, I think, and um, helps us to kind of think about, uh, you know, it gives us um, pointers for how to evaluate, you know, every time someone is saying like, uh, okay, AI can help us to solve this thing. What are the questions you need to be asking about? How is it actually trying to solve it? Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it for me. Over back to you, IS. All right, thank you, Ash. Thank you, Ash, for joining on. All right, thanks, Ash. Cool. All right, so that's right. the end of the data dump. So, <laughs> in the previous one, we talked about uh, Metaflow, which is uh, something Netflix open sourced. It's the end-to-end -end machine learning sort of uh, framework. 
uh, this is a 10 minutes, a very good 10 minutes uh, tutorial or guide on how to use Metaflow. And uh, yeah, there's a link is here. You guys can check it out. Yes, okay. So we are almost there for the main event. Uh, but before that, if you want slides after the event, uh, please go to our, our meetup group. Links are in the description. And also, we really appreciate feedback. If any of you miss the Slido poll, uh, the, it's, the questions are also in the feedback form, and we really appreciate feedback so we can improve sessions. Uh, not just the good feedback, we also appreciate the bad ones so we yeah. can take action and you know make the sessions a bit better. All right, so we are here at the main event, the talks. And uh, let me add this, our speakers in. Hello, Brian. Hello, Hi. Hey. hey, guys. So we'll start off by Brian on his talk on uh, applications of data and AI in Imagine. So uh, you could take it away, Brian. Your screen. Yep. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Brian. So I'm the head of data and AI at Imagine Groups. And for today's agenda, I will give you an introductory presentation of what we do. And I'll walk you through some applications of data AI at Imagine. And in addition to my introductory presentations, uh, today we will hear from um, Dr. Koch. He will show you how to use deep learning to quantitatively evaluate the statics of images and the application in one to three hour. So first of all, a brief uh, background about uh, Imagine. Imagine is a leading global creative ecosystem powered by design and technological innovations. We have uh, 44 uh, offices worldwide and about uh, and over 200 employees and content portfolio of more than 120 million files. Uh, so to uh, truly understand what we do, I have attached a YouTube link here. So later on, I'll share the slides and you can just uh, go to this uh, YouTube uh, link to uh, look at our corporate videos. And um, now that I have you some brief idea of what we do, by and large, we are an e-commerce company. And under Imagine Groups, this is the portfolio of our products. And our three uh, main core products are 123IF. Uh, one to three is one of the world's largest digital stock agency. As of today, we have close to uh, 120 million unique contents on this site. And then our second core product is Pixla. Pixla is an online photo editor for making quick adjustments and retouches to a photo. And last but not least is our design.ai. It's a one-stop shop for freelancers, agency, SSME, for design needs. So these suites of products consist of several AI design tools, such as uh, Video Maker and also um, Logo Maker. And um, for our department, which is the data and AI departments, our main, uh, our works mainly fall into these four areas. First one is predictive modeling and user personalizations. So in short, this is data science and analytics, right? And second one is enhanced user experience. So what I'm talking about here is uh, using AI to create better experience uh, in our one to three five sites. So for example, we have uh, developed this so-called uh, reward image search in one to drive to help our customer to find the perfect images faster. And uh, third, we have optimized design Inspired by how our customer are using the image editing features in Pixla, we have developed several photo editing features for optimizing the editing process. And last, we have a simplified design. So here I'm referring to our software as a service design.ai. And he has several AI design tools for agency, SME, for all their design needs. So I'll start off. Uh, with predictive modeling and user personalization. And um, we are quite advanced or quite ahead in terms of using analytics and also machine learning models. 
So this is our way, uh, our analytics and AI platform on cloud. So we are AWS uh, customers, and I'm not gonna go in depth to discuss this platform. So basically it's quite standard. So in our operation, we have uh, disparate data sources in silo. So we use the ingestion uh, engine to ingest the data into the data lake. And then our data is big data, right? It's uh, user behavior data. So we use the Spark uh, engine, the Spark framework to process it. So when the data is processed, it goes into the serving layer or the machine learning layer. And we use uh, Python, Spark ML, EMR, and also TensorFlow to build the data size models. And then the endpoints are the consumers of our analytics outcome. So we're using this insight for least generations. We also uh, push some of the result to marketing automation engine, and also the result going to a business dashboard using Power BI. As far as uh, analytic use cases go, so this is a summary of uh, our analytics works. So in customer analytics, uh, we have done a product cross sell and upsell. We also done a sales conversion modeling, churn model, customer segmentation, and so forth. Uh, you can see that uh, it's not only customer analytics, we also expanded it into online marketing and system design. Yeah, so this is the first area we are working on in, um, in, I mean, in our department. So the second one is enhanced user experience. So what am I talking about? So I'm gonna switch to um, the website. So, wait. Okay. So you should be looking at one, two, three RF. So uh, I just wanna show you some of the highlights of our AI works. So uh, right off the bat, you see these training keywords. So we use the auto-regressive auto model to predict the training keywords. So that's first. And then if you go to the search box, uh, you can bring in, instead of, instead of doing text search, yeah, you can bring in a person, so you can bring in an image into that. So it will use an image to search for relevant pictures or similar pictures, okay? And then uh, the other uh, AI that we have done is so-called research search. You can go into this uh, result page and click on that. Okay. Okay, do you guys see this? Uh, this is, okay, you know, let me switch to, okay, let me switch it to, to a different page. Wait. Okay, do you guys see this? So I click on that result page and uh, you can actually use the selection tool to narrow down your search. Because in the image, you can have a uh, different object. So you can see I selected this couple. So you can see most of the result actually uh, contains this cup, contains a couple in the images. Yeah. So, uh, so these are just some of the highlights in one, two, three that we have done. So just recently, we also implemented a search understanding models. So um, let me go back to, okay, here you go. It's a page. Okay. So just recently we have implemented a search understanding models. So prior to the implementation of this model, a long query here, right? Or a niche request or query with wrong keywords will return no results, right? So what we have done is uh, we use some sort of uh, sentence embedding models, right? So even if now I key in a wrong query, okay? you will return results of uh, similar contextual meaning, okay? So all this work done here actually, you know, help, help our user to, to uh, enhance their experience when they come to our website and do search, okay? So now next 
switch back to um, our uh, slides. Uh, instead of doing that, let's go to our other product, which is Pixla, photo editing, uh, photo editing, photo editors, online photo editors. So uh, inspired by how our user have been using the Pixla software, so our team have been building uh, several AI features to help our customer to optimize the editing process. So there are uh, there are both free and also pay version. You can try it out. So I'm going to Pixla E. Okay. So let me just open an image. Go to here. So it bring out the editor, and you can do um, auto adjustments or menu adjustments. Let me adjust it. Uh, adjust the brightness and contrast. Okay, or you can use auto adjustments. So you dim the picture a little bit. By the way, this auto adjustment is not using AI. We actually have developed an auto fixing AI models. So uh, very soon it'll be integrated into Pixla. You can also apply a different filter to the image. And to the left, you have different editing features, such as uh, cropping, liquefied, Chrome, fill, color out, hue, right? So let's try hue. So hue basically will uh, take out part of the image. So this patch of water, I don't like it, so I just applied it. Okay. You can see it's gone, but the result is not, doesn't look good, right? So uh, we have. We are in the midst of developing uh, image imprinting models using deep learning. So it's about 70% ready. So we will, we will be integrating that as well into this uh, Pixla platforms. Yeah. And so far in Pixla, uh, the only AI features that we are implemented is background remover. So let me try it out. Okay, so I so create a new layer. I input a new image. Don't mind the watermark. So I move it to here. Okay, I go to cutout. So they are uh, less intelligent uh, cutout method here. For example, there's this magic cutout. So this requires you to click on part of the image that you want to remove. As you can see, it's not very smart. So I click reset, go back to the original image. Instead, you can use our AI cutout uh, features. So this is developed using deep learning. Yep, it's not bad. So you're missing part of the shoe, but it's okay. Our second version, our second version of the background remove model, will actually handle this very well. So uh, okay, and the other thing you see is that the uh, the blending of the two images is not very well. So it's something also we're working on. So I then go to uh, cropping, trying the cropping uh, features. You can try uh, different ratios. I try four, three. However, this is not based on deep learning. So this is just a very simple uh, cropping uh, features. But we do have two versions of cropping model ready, which are using deep learning. So one is based on saliency model, and another one is based on object detection. So very probable we also integrate them into these features. I mean, into Pixla. Apply. That's it. Okay. So uh, and last but not least is um, design to AI. Okay. Okay, so this is a one-stop shop for all design needs. So it has local maker, video makers, and coming up is a uh, design maker. Uh, I think it will be released uh, in the next two months. And underneath here, we have uh, a few mini AI tools. So these are free. So local maker allows you to make a logo between two minutes. It's very simple to use. 
I'm just gonna go ahead and show you a video maker and what it is about. All right, so uh, video maker, uh, all you're gonna do is um, insert um, text that is uh, represent your company or your products. And these two will generate uh, two minutes videos, couple videos based on whatever you can, okay? I've done that and select a color. So uh, from the text, it's able to tell that the industry of the text belongs to IT and internet or business and marketing or spot. So I select the relevant the industry. I select a uh, mode of the video. So for uh, this design to AI, so far what we have done is just uh, keyword extraction for multi languages. We have also built a text summarizer for design AI. Yeah, and moving forwards, I believe that we can do more chunky AI, such as building a text to video embedding models. Okay, so. Um, I just run the video. Welcome to the future of content creation where design is much more manageable for the designer, one that enables them to achieve bigger creative goals in the shortest time like never before. Within Magic's proprietary AI brain, no designer will have to start designing from a blank canvas again. Instead, they can expect... So I'm going to stop it right there. I think you guys uh, got the idea of what this is about. So I'm gonna switch back to um, my slides. So uh, that read out my 10 minutes presentations. And um, I would like to share with you the link to our team website is uh, imaginebrain.com. And um, I'm just gonna show you the website. And it basically outlines what we do. Okay, this is the website. So it basically outlines uh, what we are doing at Imagine. And uh, like I say, these are the four core areas: AI in search, computer visions, customer intelligence, and AI in graphic design. And you get to see some example as well. Okay, and then you can click off and click on any one of this and you bring it to another page. So it tell you more details about uh, what we are doing. Okay, so working on um, AI in search and some of the uh, image processing that we're currently working on are some are ready to be deployed. For example, auto HDR, load light enhancement, and uh, auto fixing and background removal. But image sharpening, state of fields, face passing, and image imprinting are still work in progress. Okay, and then we also have uh, we've done analytics in customer predictive, customer segmentation, and so forth. And in time, design as well. Um, so some uh, a very interesting project that we're currently working on is uh, auto copywriter. Basically can generate text for marketing campaigns based on uh, brief user inputs. Yeah, so that's all. <laughs> awesome, thanks Brian. No problem. Cool. So next up, everybody, we have uh, Dr. Kok with uh, his talk on building an aesthetic model to read images. 
I'll switch up to the slides. Yep, you can take it away. Hello, everyone. My name is Jin Xian. Today, I will talk about building a deep learning model for rating images. So, why is aesthetic scoring important for us? As Brian, my colleague, has already told everyone, so uh, we have a huge library of images. With this amount of images, it can be difficult for users to find what they want easily and quickly. If we have a model that can help to score images, then we can sort the images and present more beautiful images to users when they come to our website. Image aesthetic scoring or classification is the problem of assigning a score or class to an image based on its aesthetic quality. In simple terms, this means given an image, how beautiful is it? Here we have two images. What do you think of these images? I'm sure uh, the image on the left is better than the image on the right. Am I right? So before building our image, uh, image aesthetic model, we need to think about the data. There are two ways we can get the data. First, we can make use of publicly available data sets. Some examples are Ewa data set, which has over 230,000 images or 30 gigs worth of images. There's also the Chinese University of Hong Kong photo quality data set with over 70,000 images. Then there's also the ADB with over 10,000 images. Or you can use your own data. If you know web scraping, perhaps you can even gather your own data set. Here are some samples from the AWA data set. On the left, we have some top rated images from the data set. On the right, we have some bottom rated images. Today, we will be uh, talking about deep learning using a deep learning model to build an uh, image aesthetic model. Deep learning is a field of machine learning which uses neural networks to solve problems. For images, we usually use a type of neural networks called convolutional neural networks. We can treat the image aesthetic problem as either a regression problem or a classification problem. In regression, we assign a score to an image from a continuous range, maybe from 0 to 1, 0 to 10, or 0 to 100. In classification, we assign a class and the probability of the image belonging to a class to an image. For example, if the image belongs to class 0, it may be uh, ugly, or if it is belongs to class 1, it may be good. This is a, this is a same model that we can use for the regression problem. In the center, we have the neural network, which can be further broken down into the CNN backbone and additional layers. For regression, we can use the no activation or sigmoid or ten, hyperbolic tangent activation at the final layer. For regression, we usually use the mean square error as the loss function. Here is a, is a CNN model that we can use for classification. As you can see, the model is similar to the previous model used for regression. However, the difference is in the final layer activation and also the loss function used. For classification, we in the final layer, we use the sigmoid activation function and also the binary cross entropy as the loss function. Activation functions are functions that are used to break linearity so that a neural network could learn non-linear functions. Recall that a neural network consists of many layers of simple functions or operations. If a neural network consists only of uh, linear functions, then the network can only learn linear functions. Because of its ability to learn complex and arbitrary functions, neural networks are often referred to as universal function approximators. There are many activation functions available, for example, sigmoid, ReLU, hyperbolic tangent. However, any uh, for in input and intermediate layers, any activation functions can be used. However, ReLU is often used because it is simple and fast to compute. It is also it has also shown to give good performance. Usually, we only need to think about the activation layer at the output layer. So how does a neural network or deep learning model learn? It learns using the gradient descent algorithm, which can be broken into four parts. First, we have the forward pass, 
where a model makes prediction given its current weights. With the prediction, then we measure how well the model is performing using a loss function. Then in the backward pass, we find contributions of variables on the loss and we make small adjustment. We adjust the variables in small steps towards the right direction to reduce the loss and we repeat this many, many steps. It's like cooking during this MCO lockdown. The first day you cook, you add too much salt and the food becomes too salty. The sec second day you cook, you reduce salt, it's still too salty. So this process is repeated over and over and eventually on the 14th day, all of us become super chef. So how do we select a CNN backbone? This is the CNN backbone. So how do we design the, uh, the architecture? So uh, in practice, we usually, we usually do not design our own model and instead use a technique called transfer learning. This means we take existing models and adapt them to our problem. Many models were designed by researchers all over the world and pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset. The ImageNet dataset is a large-scale image dataset with over 40 million images and 1,000 classes. On the right is a table of some pre-trained ImageNet models that is available in the Keras framework. ResNet 50 is a good performance that we can try as it is not too big and offers great starting performance. Please visit this link for more information. So after we have our CIM backbone, we add additional layers and a final layer. Then we select the appropriate loss function for the problem and the metric that is used to measure the model performance. Now I will be going through a sample coding walkthrough of how we can train our aesthetic model in TensorFlow 2.0. First is the imports. We will be op using the OpenCV library for image input and output and manipulation. We will also be using augmentations for image augmentation. First, we will do some data exploration. We will be, for this training, we will be using the AADB dataset, which can be downloaded from this location. First, I Define where images are stored on my computer. And then I load the data labels, which is located between uh, these CSV files. Here is what the train data set looks like. There are several columns. There's an image ID, which is the name of the file. Then we have the score. We also have other features that we will not be using for this tutorial. Here, I define a load image function which will load our image given its part. And here we sample an image from the from our data set and print it. Here is our defined model function is our model function that will create our model. Here we instantiate our model and we print out the summary of the model. As you can see, there are many layers in this model and this model, the summary function, will give us the type of layers, the output shape and the number of parameters. Next, we will be defining our input pipeline First, uh, I will define some TensorFlow graph ops to load image, to decode image, and to pre-process our image. Here is our get data, get data set function, which will take in a data frame, which contains our 
image path column and the label path and the label column and give and return us a image that uh, uh, return us a TensorFlow data set. Here is the here is the our image pipeline for each path in for for each path for each of our image path we load the image and if transform is defined we perform transformation on the image and then if a preprocessing function is given we also preprocess the function then we pair the image with the score together and then we batch it. Here we define our our train data set and we iterate the first batch. As you can see, the first batch has eight images, each of 256 by 256 by three channels, three for RGB, one for RGB channel. And we have eight score. And then we sample an image from the batch and we print the score and the picture. Next, we will perform our training. First, we, we define some hyperparameters. We define our training and validation data set. We compile the model and we train the model. After we train the model, we evaluate the model on the test data set which have not been trained on by our model. Here we define our evaluate model function and we evaluate our model. As you can see, our model uh, uh, have a loss of this, mean square error of this, and mean absolute of this for the test data set. Next, we try to improve our model by using a technique called data augmentation. Data augmentation is a technique that can generate additional images from existing images. Here is our image augmentation pipeline, which will randomly flip images, randomly rotate images up to 90 degrees, randomly adjust the brightness and contrast of images, randomly turn images to grayscale, and ran randomly resize and crop. Here we have the original image and the augmented images. Here we define a second model and we define our training data set with uh, data augmentation. The difference here compared to previously is that we, in this pipeline, we have, we apply the data augmentation to each and every image and then we train our model. After we train our model, model, we will evaluate on the test set. If we compare the model two and model one, it seems that model one gives a better performance on the testing set. Now that we have trained our model, we can use it to perform some inference. Here we define our predict function and here we sample an image from the data set and then we make a prediction from, from the image. As you can see, for this image, our model predicts a score of 0 0.67. Now that we have our model, we can export the model in TensorFlow safe model format to be served in production. That is all from me. Stay home and stay safe. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Kok. So hey. those are the two talks we have today. And now uh, we'll have questions for the speakers. One second, let me add my screen. So uh, anybody who have questions on the last talk or the talk that Brian gave about imagine groups data stuff. 
please feel free to add it in the comments. Uh, we have a few already. Let me put them up. Oh, okay. This one, we can't disclose, sorry. <laughs> cool. Oh, even high level. <laughs> we can't, <laughs> we can't, sorry. Yeah. All right. I have a question though. Okay. Uh, re yeah, regarding the keyword, the keyword in the whole page. We're mining. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is it uh, personalized for every user or like even no, it's if. Not. So it's, it's based just on whatever uh, input text that the user key. Right. I mean, the, the keyword section below though. Uh, Is it. I want to try. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you referring to uh, which products? The uh, one or, or design or AI? The one in one two three RF. The okay. keywords. There's a lot of keywords there. Is it ranked by different users' preference, or how do you rank those keywords though? Uh, keywords ranking. Uh, okay. I try to understand your questions, and um. We don't rank the keywords, but the uh, returning results, right, are images. Right. Images. So is rank the results are ranked based on the keywords of the images, and whatever you key in the into the query. Thank if you. you're doing text search. All right. All right thank you. Yeah. Uh, another question here: If I want to compute, if I want faster computation, do you think Dask or PySpark will help? Uh, it really depends on volume of data. So let's say your data is small, then you can go ahead with Panda. If your data, let's say, I would say less than is, if your data is between uh, one hundred megabytes and maybe few gigabytes, uh, it's best to use Dask. And if anything more than two gigabytes, then I think you should proceed with high sparks. Right. Another one here. Yeah. How are you okay. guys making the query on search work efficiently? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we can't tell you. How how does it work? How do you work? Uh, and Josh, uh I someone just told me that I think you're asking question about the trending keywords, right? The yeah, that one. That okay. one. Okay. And what is your question again? Sorry, can you repeat? How, how do you actually rank them? Like because you oh, talk about okay. Okay. Yeah, you talk so about we actually uh extract their historical uh, search frequency and use that to build forecasting models and predict in future what is their search frequency. Right. You get it? Is it personalized for every user or no, it's personalized only for every, every keyword? Oh, okay. No, it's not personalized for uh, every user, but for the entire website. Right, right. Okay. Now we have another one. Uh, do you guys manage your own Spark cluster? Or okay. manage so we use both. Uh, we are actually trying both. So uh, we use EMR, and uh, we also use uh, standalone uh, Spark clusters. So we actually use both. So it depends on the engineers or data scientist skill sets. So some data scientists are not very uh, IT savvy. So I think then EMI is a better choice for them. Okay. Actually, with regards to that question, so how do you guys, uh, you have, how do data engineers work with data scientists in, in Okay, so uh, in our uh, department, right, our data engineers, their main job is actually to build the data pipelines on the analytics side. And our data scientists, roles are mainly to build the predictive models and also the prescriptive models because uh, predictive model without action is basically uh, useless to us. So, uh, and also the data engineer are responsible for deploying 
our AI models. So they're actually very important to us. Right. So something like the Spark Managed Service, will uh, data engineers sort of onboard data scientists first, or do they liaise with data scientists? Uh, on that, actually, I'm the one who, who, who did that. I'm the one uh, who actually uh, commissioned the, the service provision. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, another question. So instead of secret sauce, maybe uh, just a little bit about architecture. <laughs> or is that the secret sauce? Uh, uh, I, I don't think I can share because uh, I think my CTO will fire me tomorrow <laughs> if I share. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's about the questions we can take today. There's been a lot, a lot of good uh, feedback from both your talk for both your talks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so thank, thank you both for sharing today. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, one final thing, if uh, we really, really cherish feedback. So yeah, the feedback link is either that bit.ly with a very catchy uh, tag, right? WTF Data Console 5. Or you could just go to the description, and then there's a feedback form. Or you could, and if you want to pick a slice, just go to meetup.com and look for our group. Also, it's in the link in the description below. Uh, look forward to a lot of other speakers uh, in the KL community. And also, uh, since everything is remote now, we're also getting a lot of people, a lot of speakers that are outside, so from Singapore and uh, beyond. Yeah. So look forward to all of that. And again, thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, Dr. Cock. And uh, have a good night, everybody. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks for coming. Bye. Bye.